Your work isn't what it used to be. You can tell, can't you? It's less than what people expect from you. Everyone thought you were fantastic. Sometimes it's just fun to talk about something that you really vibe with. So today we're gonna to be looking at Fantastic Four Full Circle by Alex Ross, which is a sequel to a story from the Lee and Kirby era. It's a classic Fantastic Four story that maybe nobody was asking for a sequel for, but here it is, and it's oh so satisfying. F4 Full Circle is a graphic novel that was licensed out to Abrams Comic Arts. And this work marks the first licensed project sent out in over 40 years according to Marvel's own press release. But you would never know that if you were just to casually pick it up. What I mean by that is that the can is tight, seamless, it doesn't feel like some kind of Elseworld story or something outside of the main universe, it feels very true to what's going on in the 616, or to the history of the 616 rather, not what's going on currently. In some ways it actually has more cohesion than some of the current canon time recording. It takes time to explain little things. Things, in ways that make sense, yet also adheres to some of the off-the-wall science from back in the day, which, while implausible, is also endearing. If there's one clear feeling that comes from reading Fantastic Four Full Circle, it's love. Love of these characters, of this universe, of their history, of their stories. It just absolutely seeps through the pages. And in some instances, does an excellent job of recontextualizing some classic character traits in a way that shows them in a new light while not fundamentally altering them. But how does it do all this? Well, first, we need to take a look at the story that it's following up from. Or rather, continuing. That was a much easier way to say that. I'm Sasha. This is Casually Comics. Let's talk Fantastic Four. Full Circle is largely, though not exclusively, focused on continuing the tale of Fantastic 451, This Man, This Monster. A story that is heralded by some as one of the best thing stories out there. And while it is a solid thing story, it's also a surprisingly poignant look at the antagonist of the issue, who is later named Ricardo Jones. Rick Jones. I see you. He's not just named in this new graphic novel. He is, but he was actually named before that. In an issue of Web of Spider-Man, where they pull out a surprise brother, because why not? Fantastic 451 was written by Stan Lee, with art by Jack Kirby, with inks by Joe Sinnott, and it was released in 1966. It is also the first instance of Reed going to the negative zone, so there's a lot happening this issue. Some of which was set up in the prior issue, such as Jones's mwahahaha, if only I had their power appearance. The thing also ends up frightening a woman on the street because of his appearance, and he was already in a maudlin mood, which sets him up to be truly down the dumps, nay depressed, in issue 51. The art in 51, particularly at the start, as the thing wanders despondent in the rain is really evocative. You can just feel that bleakness. The Thing ends up at Jones's home, who presents himself as a kind stranger, an ear that's willing to listen. And he pulls a credible, we have some stuff in common. Not a we're the same, you and I, but just that also I have been through things. I felt how you felt. Let's commiserate, basically. I'm beginning to sound like a blasted soap opera. That's all right. I don't mind. What's the angle, pal? You a talent scout for a freak show or something? No, but I too have been rejected. I'm a scientist, but I'm also a man who knows how it feels to be scorned by others, to be mocked and ridiculed because of my theories. He also sees his main motivation in this conversation, subtly at first and then a bit more aggressively, but it comes across more like fawning than like what it actually is, which is jealousy. He starts talking about Reed, how he wishes he had his money, his equipment, his fame, all those things that Reed can do because he has those things. It turns out that he drugged the thing's tea because Ben can't go anywhere. And also that his negative mindset had been amplified thanks to Jones's sublime liminal influencer that he'd also used to lure him there. A neat invention. Terrifying, but effective. He's also made a duplication apparatus. He was the perfect choice for my experiment because of our slight skeletal resemblance. That fact will make the duplication process all the more effective. Becomes the thing, down to the molecular level, and he's thrilled. He's gonna get all the money and fame and women that come with being the thing. This device has also turned Ben back into a normal person, so he feels that Ben shouldn't have anything to complain about. Now he just needs to go and infiltrate the Baxter building, and he's been studying the thing and his speech patterns, and he feels like he's ready. I guess he's really good, because when the real Ben shows up, they think he's the imposter. So Ben storms off. He's gonna go hang out with Alicia. Now what follows isn't exactly where you may assume the story is going. The easy route would have been, wow, being the thing isn't great. All of those problems that he talks about, the ostracization, the not feeling at home in one's own skin, terrifying other people. Those are actually awful. That could have all been too much for Jones, but instead we get something different. We have Jones discovering something else, something far more poignant. While he's there, Reed is setting up to go off into the negative zone. It's not quite called that yet, but that's where he's going. This is something he feels he must do because of the threats against the Earth, such as Galactus and more. He knows there's more out there, and he's hidden a lot of his fears from Sue. But he wants the Earth to be protected on all fronts, even in areas that they're not aware that they need protection. And this is also why he's keeping some things, like the portal to the negative zone, a secret. In seeing all of this, Jones is faced with the realization 
realization that this man that he's envied, his life isn't actually that great. It's actually hard and perilous, and that he's not seeking out glamour or fame at every turn like he'd thought. That those are byproducts of the work, but not the intent, and that they're not even bringing any joy. He also sees that Reed is willing to make sacrifices that he, Jones, isn't. He doesn't want to potentially die in some unknown dimension. I always thought he was just a glamour pants. Hey, we only call Captain America glamour pants around here. Out for all the dough and glory he could get, but he's tackling a job that won't net him a plugged nickel. And he's doing it without any fanfare or publicity. It came without ribbons. It came without tags. <laughs> He's having a Grinch moment. Some of the panels you see here in this issue are also going to be revisited in full circle, and it's really rewarding. Now, for our extremely scientific trip into the void, Reed is employing a tether system. If he tugs real hard, it means he's in trouble. You got to pull him back. And of course, you know that that's what happens. He ends up in there. There's an anti-Earth. There's gravity. It's pulling him towards it. All these years, when I thought I never got the breaks, now I know the truth. It was my fault. Nobody else's. I wouldn't work hard enough. I wouldn't make the sacrifices that a Reed Richards would. I never saw things so clear before. It's, it's, it's almost like I've really become the thing, not just an imitation. Is that how Ben feels? I don't know. But the more important thing about this moment is we see that Ricardo has realized that he's been victimizing himself. It's effective and sad for the reader as well because we've seen him mention some details about his life when he was talking to Ben earlier on. It just conjures up images of this bitter, lonely life. And for what? He was talented. He had good inventions. But he was so focused on that perceived unfairness that he couldn't pull his own life together. It's a powerful moment and one that still resonates. So he decides he's going to have a big damn hero moment and save Reed. As for me, I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. Not many men get a second chance to make up for the rotten things they've done in their lifetime. I guess I'm luckier than most. I got that chance, for I finally learned what it means to have a friend. Chills. Painful, sad chills as he's hurtling down towards the anti-Earth's atmosphere. Of course, his seeming death means that the thing reverts back to his thing form. All before he gets to Alicia, of course. Then he goes back, the team is reunited, and that's all they wrote for the time. I would argue that this is a stronger Jones story than a Thing story, even though he's only in it for a little bit. It has some good moments for Ben, but it's very much a status quo story for him. It's the familiar tread of accepting being the Thing. Where it shines is not just Jones, but insights into Reed. But this theme of working through feelings about Ben is carried through into this 2022 graphic novel. You have this jacket narration featuring Sue when she's lamenting some of her guilt about telling Ben that he was a coward before they take their trip. And after our ominous opening of a mysterious figure staring up at the Baxter building, we even open on Ben just trying to enjoy a sandwich. And right away, you'll be struck by the level of intricate detail in these illustrations. Look at how textured the thing is. You can get the idea of how rough and rocky he must be just by looking at him. Alex Ross posted some videos on his YouTube channel about the making of this graphic novel. One of them is about how he made these models. They're sculpted, and so then he could use them as references for what he wanted to do in the story. It is both the nerdiest and the coolest thing that I've seen in a while. I'll post a link. I sewed the shorts and then, you know, sculpted on all the epoxy, and now I've got this figure that can do all these poses for me. How's it going, big guy? Jeez! It's never a good time to be one of Ben's sandwiches in a Fantastic Four story. Now this mysterious figure is inside the building, triggering an alert. And so this, of course, summons Reed and Sue. And there's a cute brother and sister moment while Johnny has to quickly reconcile while Reed came out putting on a shirt and Sue is invisible. Sibling things you don't want to think about. The body is that of a mysterious man that only the thing recognizes as having met once. This is a nice detail and bit of continuity because the rest of the team never saw Jones in his original form. They only saw him once he had already transformed into the thing. And Ross asked more things too, like Johnny asking where was he when this happened, because in that issue, 51, he was off at college becoming besties with Wyatt Wingfoot. There's a brief recap of 51 that's well done for a couple of reasons. One, it showcases Ross's typical art style, highlighting that he is playing with another one for the main illustrations. Something that has a bit more of that classic Kirby influence, but is still also very distinctly his own. Nobody's eyebrows have gotten to Kirby levels. You can still see that love of realism that he has in these illustrations. Another clever thing is that this recap is lacking in details. It doesn't have the details that the team wouldn't have. So they don't know why Jones did what he did, why he was in the building, why he transformed into the thing. They don't know any of that because all of that was in his own internal monologue. So there's no way they could know that. This is why if you have read issue 51, you'll get more out of this. It's still easy to follow and enjoy without prior knowledge, but if you have it, you'll get extra rewards out of reading it. You'll have moments like, oh, I remember why he did that. Remembering issue 51 all these years is paying off. And if you're enjoying this, but you don't know what they're talking about, it could potentially 
eventually drive you to want to check it out. Which is why it would be nice if there was an editor's note telling you where to go. This is just the week of me ranting about editor's notes, apparently. As mentioned, you get to see some of the panels from the original recreated, which is cool. Like this panel of Reed going into the zone. Reed doesn't actually bear too much ill will towards this stranger because ultimately he did save his life. It's while they're there pondering what's going on that this horrible insectoid creature just starts crawling out of the corpse's mouth. So you have a couple of cool pages of the team having to fight them off and you get to see them all use their powers and how they work together. See them work as a team. Now the flow of these panels is very kinetic. It's not a straight up panel to panel format. It's more of a flowing action movement and you're meant to follow that along. Be it the creatures or them using their powers but there's a bit more of a flow to it. So while some may find it easy to follow, for others it may feel a bit frantic or frenetic or it may break their flow. Miles will vary. The art is trying to guide you in the direction that it wants you to go but depending upon what you're used to reading it may be jarring. Now an attack like this means they have to go in the negative zone so Sue goes to get a babysitter, Agatha Harkness. The relationship between the team in this is just very tight. It feels very true to their characterizations both over time and as they've evolved. Basically where they should be for the time period that this appears to be. Their flaws, foibles, but also their strengths are all on display. Susan, you're in... Look, Reed, I know you. I've contacted Agatha to come over and hold down the fort. They invaded our home where our children live. Let's not waste any time in bringing the fight to them. Reed and Sue have two children by this point and a very strong connection. They're very secure in their marriage. They have a strong understanding of each other. It doesn't mean that they don't butt heads or that it's perfect and that there are no problems, but it does mean that they found areas of compromise that work well for each other. And especially in a battle scenario like this, it really works because Sue always wanted to come along. And one of the things was that sometimes Reed would try and stop her. So this is a really nice evolution of seeing them just come to this point where no, she's already set up things, she's coming. Now the references as mentioned are not just issue 51. But we start to see hints of references to battles with Annihilus, or more importantly, Janus, the Nega Man. Like seeing the creature who was seen in his first appearance. Now the team go in some newfangled costumes instead of taking their ship and they explain it away with some tech in the tech. And from here on in, it's a wild, trippy ride into the negative zone, including this absolutely gorgeous panel of Annihilus. They of course run into some trouble and it's a version of Janus. He's one of the people who Reed went to school with who now hates him. There's just a whole list. They should form a club. For him, we need to go back to 107, his first appearance in 1971. One. He was created by Stan Lee and John Buscema in another story that saw the thing reverting to human form and this time seemingly being able to change at will in between the two. Janet shows up obsessed with the negative zone. This so he can harness the power of negative energy or nega power and become the nega man. His story is not quite as touching as Jones's despite the fact that you get more of it. He just barges in, goes full supervillain, and then the story goes Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There's two of him. He split himself into two versions. One is the negative version and one is his regular version. He ends of shooting himself, but he can't stop experimenting, so does it again. It gets more convoluted than it needs to be for a little bit. Stanley loved a good Jekyll and Hyde reference. If it could happen, it was gonna happen. He would end up working with Annihilus and would become one of those characters who would seemingly die only to reappear having somehow survived. They play with that here by having him be twisting the very negative zone itself, which has now become kind of his domain. He's creating this nightmarish hellscape that he calls Nega Life. And yes, they make a Mega Man joke in there because his name is so reminiscent of that. Your work isn't what it used to be. You can tell, can't you? It's less than what people expect from you. Everyone thought you were fantastic. Your legacy is going to reflect the degradation of your skills. You're letting everyone down. There's a lot of read bitterness this issue. Defeating the Nega Man, who is the one who used Jones's corpse to try and piggyback negative zone monsters into the main dimension, is the more convoluted part of the story. You just kind of have to ride out the science, just like some of those Star Trek episodes. Reverse the shield polarity. Eject the warp core. But if you do try and follow what they're talking about, it does match up with previous discussions of the negative zone and the established lore, but it also moves it forward a little bit. His desire for Nega power brought him here where he died most violently upon contact with a planet's anti matter atmosphere. You are a thing that thinks it's a man, but you're just an echo of one. Why can't any of these cosmic beings that aren't actually people think they're nice people? With all that done, they're hurtling towards the anti-earth and Reed wants to go there. There's a nice moment with Ben where he has to work through some trust issues and when they get there, they encounter not just the people of the planet, but also Jones. He's alive. Well, a version of him made out of negative energy, but it's his true self. He's just negative now. And he has to live in a containment suit because of it, because despite appearances, this earth is positive. But despite all this, he's turned his life around. He has friends, a purpose. He's happy. And in a way, him having to live his life in this containment suit, a bit separate from everybody else, has him atone for his villainous acts in the past issue. So that's already dealt with based on the life that you know he's lived for all these years. He even thanks the thing for changing his life. This by changing his outlook. You made me realize, as did Dr. Richards, the foolishness of my jealousy of him. I was 
a better man when I was you. That hits hard, that hits deep. And guess what? It's time for those newfangled suits to pay off. They were checkoff suits. Reed's able to stretch his out and cut off a piece. Enough so that Jones can live outside of his containment suit for the first time in years. I, I've been living in this suit for so long. Thank you. These two panels, there's just so much emotion conveyed in them. I teared up the first time I read it and I have prickles a little bit thinking about it. It's not just because I have a cold. <laughs> just the way the sheer humble gratitude is able to leap off the page. It's just such a nice moment for both of them to see Jones is gonna be able to have this new life after he's really turned around and also to see that the team is just nice, that they forgive him, that there's not all this bitterness and angerness for what he's done, but just the willingness to give him a second chance. It's really heartwarming. And the team learn his name because they did know it and it's very conceivable that the reader wouldn't have known it either unless they read that random web of spider-man issue so it's a moment that really humanizes him he's not just this guy who stole the thing's body he's ricardo jones an example of how a different mindset can completely turn your life around even if it's not perfect inspiring vibes of course the team get back home and settle into their routines hug your kids but there's this dark and really good read moment right at the end at the start of the video i mentioned presenting old traits through a new lens well here's an example of that read despite not always being acknowledged by other characters in the Marvel Universe has some striking negative traits. It's part of what makes him so interesting. He's complex. But a key one that's often highlighted is arrogance, evasiveness, secretiveness around his work, which can come across quite badly, like he's just hoarding inventions, or like he thinks he's better than everybody else. Here, these tendencies are framed as coming from a place of anxiety and fear, brought on by his intellect and ability to foresee options and outcomes other people can't. I believe the phantom-like nightmares which take physical form there, like Janice's death up behind, exist because we imagine them too. Even a nihilist may be a manifestation of our subconscious. For that one man Ricardo still exists there and thrive, he had to be bound with others who came to embody a positive energy to survive a psychopathically negative environment. It makes you think about the whole nature of existence. I wonder what it all reveals about a guiding hand over our lives. Are we merely playthings to some greater forces? We're home, we're safe. Can you just be happy for once? The end. Then it was listening time, not dismissive time. Maybe he guessed like this a lot and Ben's just like, can I please eat my sandwich? These panels are really good because they frame Reed's actions, his secrecy and obsession in a more understandable and humanizing light. He's consumed not just by ambition and ideas, by the dark side of that, the inability to turn your mind off, to stop thinking, to stop seeing those possibilities, intrusive thoughts everywhere. And in this moment when he tries to convey some of that, he's just shut down. If one feels misunderstood or like they're going to be or have had several instances of being misunderstood, withdrawal is understandable. It really works because it doesn't take away that these tendencies that he has can manifest quite negatively or that he sometimes goes about things the wrong way. He can still be arrogant and abrasive, but it gives you some different insights into the potentials of why. It's an impressive character moment and Ben got his sandwich. Hooray! This graphic novel is just a love letter to the Fantastic Four. And if you're a fan of the first family, it's just a real treat. You get to see them going on a classic style adventure that takes a bunch of their history, plays with it, updates it, follows up on it while honoring it and not trying to mock it or subvert it. Now, of course it won't be for everyone. If you don't care for Ross's art styles, then that's pretty much this whole book. So it probably won't land for you. Although this style is slightly different from his standard one, so it may be enough to sway some people. If one wasn't a fan of this version of the Fantastic Four, the era being referenced, it may not land as well. Or some may just not be interested in seeing these threads picked up upon. And of course, if you don't like the Fantastic Four, then no, probably won't like it. And while you can jump in, some may be frustrated by not having all the prior knowledge of people and events referenced. Personally, I find this book absolutely beautiful. It really does feel like art and there's so many details and it's so rewarding to look at and it takes time to get through it and there's reread value just even just for looking at it. It also gets some bonus points for me because both my kids loved it. So I already liked it but that swayed it up into the stratosphere. My eldest was trying to sound out all the words and just fell in love with the idea of a negative zone and anti-earth and the monster page because she's a monster kind of kid so all of the different faces on there while her younger sisters just sat beside her going the colors. It was just nice to see them transported like that by art, to see their imaginations just light up and be so excited. It was heartwarming, a reminder of how exciting these works can be. Not something that closes your mind, but something that opens it. I'm a big sap, what can I say? So this book was for me, but that doesn't mean that it will be for you. I want to hear from you. Did you like it? Did you not like it? If not, please tell me why. Alternative takes welcome. Did you like how it updated Jones's story? The lore of the negative zone. Would you like to see more licensed out works like this one? Or only if they were like this one? Because <laughs> this went well. It's not always going to go this well. Share all your thoughts down below. While you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you don't miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking some time today spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it. I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.